All right. Thank you all for being here today. Today is Wednesday, September 21st, and it is OPAC Commission meetings, community meeting, as mandated by the ordinance that created us in 2020. We are required to have four community meetings every year. Um, this is actually our fourth meeting. I think we had our first one um, one year ago, almost exactly October of last year. And then, um, so what I wanted to do is do a quick introduction of who is actually in the room today. Um, but before I get there, um, I am Stephanie Everett. I'm the executive director of the Office of Police Accountability and Transparency. Um, and this meeting is a public meeting. It is a community meeting. It is not a hearing. We will not be discussing cases here to put that out there, but I wanted to just let you all know that the meeting is being recorded. Um, this is our first foray into a hybrid format, so please bear with us. There are um, individuals who will be joining us on Zoom, as well as those who are in um, the office with us here at 2201 Washington Street in Roxbury. Um, we also have um, with us the um, chair of the Internal Affairs Oversight Panel, Honorable Leslie Harris, and joining us on Zoom is chair of the Civilian Review Board, Peter Alvarez. Morning. The three of us make up the commission. So um, before I go any deeper, I wanted to let you know that we are also providing language access um, for those who need it. So we have turned on the Zoom's auto captioning for those who are joining us virtually. Each person will need to opt into these captions. So um, you can select the live transcript button on the two bar at the bottom of your Zoom screen to see the captions appear. And the... Not yet. And the OPAC staff, they'll send you instructions in the chat, but also... Um, the OPAC. We also have an, interpretation, um, an interpreter available. Interpreters available. And so for Spanish, we have Erica Perez. And Gabriela, Gabriela Herrera, please forgive me if I mispronounce your name. Um, you should also see on your screen we have um, AS, ASL interpretation. Um, for Mandarin, we have Terry Yin and Tina Wayne. Vietnamese, Vietnamese is Duen. Am I saying this right? Chue? Chue? And Mayang Shi. And Haitian Creoles, Saduk Brazil and Cynthia Lane. And Cabo Verde Creole. Ven Venusa Gomez Green. And then Vindo, Vindo Cruz. I against, I am so sorry if I just tore up everyone's name. So I'll let everyone, if you need interpretation services, please select the interpretation button on the two bar on the bottom of your Zoom screen and select the channel that you need. And the interpretation teams, you can introduce, introduce yourself and explain how to opt into the language channels as well. So we'll take a minute for that. Muy buenas tardes y bienvenidos a esta reunión comunitaria de OPAT. Eh, queremos que sepan que tenemos interpretación al español para esta reunión, como siempre. Y para accesar esta interpretación a español, otro idioma que deseen, si hablan varios, tienen que ir a la parte inferior de su pantalla y ver en la barra horizontal la tecla interpretación todavía no está activada. Tienen que esperar un momentito, por favor, a que todos los intérpretes hagan el anuncio en su idioma. Luego van a seleccionar el idioma que desea porque tenemos varios esta tarde. Y después de seleccionar, usted entrará a la reunión en el idioma español. 
Bienvenidos. Gracias. 大家好，我和 Terry 会今天做您的普通话的同传服务。那么一会儿他们打开了这个地球仪之后，请您选择普通话的同传翻译。那么如果您是用手机或者是平板 iPad 上线的话，那么请你点击三个点，在您的手机或者平板的右下角，然后再选择相应的语言。那我和 Terry 一会儿在线上见呢。祝您今天会议过得愉快。Next interpreter, please. Good morning.、Uh, my name is Yuan Zhou, Mei Han Chef, and I will be the interpreter for the meeting today.、Uh, xin chào quý vị và các anh chị. Nếu anh chị cần、uh, tiếng Việt,、uh, xin bấm vào quả cầu và chọn ngôn ngữ tiếng Việt thì chúng tôi sẽ cung cấp thông dịch liên tục cho các anh chị. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Cynthia Lin and Sadak, and I will be your interpreter Haitian Creole today. Uh, bonjour. Nous sommes ici pour vous aider et nous allons parler avec Sadak. Basil qui a interprété pour aujourd'hui. Pour interprétation créole haïtien, allez dans contrôle bas, dans partie en bas, écran et puis cliquez sur interprétation. Après ça, cliquez sur langue que vous t'avez mis en déa. Qu'on y a aucun accès à réunion en créole haïtien. Good, mo good morning. This is the K version, one of the K version interpreters. My name is Vanusa. Bom dia, que ele é um de que é o intérprete que também faz a interpretação para o crioulo de Cabo Verde. Uh, favor para o Sisti Ezrunhão e uh, o Bill está、uh, a ser traduzido na crioulo. Calca na barra de controlo que está fica na parte horizontal, na parte inferior do computador. Bota calca naquele botão que está para Interpretation. Depois calca no idioma que está para Cabo Verde para poder ouvir a tradução na crioulo. Já vou testar o Bíquel para a reunião na Crioulo. Obrigado, tenha bom dia. Bom dia. Thank you all so much for being present with us. Então, nós vamos passar rapidamente para a agenda, o que vocês estão esperando para hoje. Então, nós vamos fazer a aprovação dos nossos minutos do nosso reunião no dia 24. We also have、um, a OPEC Commission public meeting. We are required by ordinance to also produce certain information out to you every time we do have a community meeting. We are making copies really quick to realize that there were no copies、um, available to the public, so you will have that in a few minutes for those who are present with us. Those who are on Zoom, you should be getting a copy sent into a link now so that you can look at this report with us. Um, we will have a public comment period. You will have 90 seconds to two minutes to comment、um, on some of the data that we present out to you and what we do say, say to you um, today. Um, and we will take your comments into consideration as we move forward in doing some more of our work、um, and go from there. And then we will join, adjourn exact,、uh, at 12:30 today. Okay.、Um, so. We still have Peter. <laughs> so now I will entertain a motion from the. I move that the minutes from September twenty-first. I'm sorry, from June. June fourteenth. Fourteenth. Oh yeah. Two thousand twenty-two. Be accepted. Second. Can I have a second?、Um, all in favor? I guess that's all of us. Aye. <laughs> Aye. Thank you. So the June fourteenth minutes are now approved. Thank you all. So the next thing we're going to go through is the community meeting, and as I stated again, that we do have、um, some mandates that we do、um, relay out to you all as a community about what、um, when we were created that the City Council and the Mayor's Office believe that we should give out to you. We will give out more information.、Um, there's some information that we are still trying to ascertain. And、um, again, this to me, I think it's the floor, not the ceiling, of information that we should be providing to the public、um, when it comes to transparency from the Boston Police Department. And、um, so, with that, I, we'll start with the budget. For、um, FY23, when we met in June, 
we were still waiting for the budget to be finalized. We're happy to report that the budget was finalized and um, what we did receive was, is what we, we requested for the FY23. So we do have two um, internships that we shall receive for the FY23. One is a high school student, one is a college student. The high school student will be paid $18 an hour. The college student will be paid $22 an hour. Um, we are actively looking at um, creating relationships with local colleges. We've reached out to a number of community colleges um, in the area to establish that relationship so we can have a college student start hopefully by January. We, we want this fall, but we're, we're still working for that to happen. Um, we did have high school students, some members in the audience, and I can't see who's on Zoom, but they did attend this summer. We did the rollout of our summer youth um, program this summer in partnership with YEE, and we will continue that with our own internal high school um, students starting this fall um, and really just working on keeping the movement of having youth involved in police reform and policy and getting them to have real efforts, um, being real purposeful and having them involved in what police reform looks like in our community. Um, we also were able to receive um, funding for, um, sorry, you all are gonna start, you're gonna get this um, now. So um, we were able to receive funding for a consultant to look at the hiring, promotion and retention of um, officer of CPD personnel, so not just officers, but the entire staff. I think it's important that when we say that we want BPD to look like our office, that like our community, we mean it from not just the officers, but everyone from the clerk up to command staff. So we have a consultant. We've sent out the request for, um, for qualification. They're due on the 30th of this month. Um, we are working in collaboration with a number of offices to um, including um, Boston Police Department. We are meeting with Infinity Bo um, Boards in the next couple of weeks um, from uh, many associations with NBPD, as well as working with um, the Office of Equity, the Human Rights Commission, to make sure that we are being very inclusive in, um, across the board to make sure that we are gonna do this work the right way and not just do a fluff of having a consultant come in and tell us what we already know, but really getting some real efforts and teeth behind the work. Um, and so we're hoping to have that consultant start. And I believe, I think our start date we have for them is beginning of November. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, we're really being intentional and in making sure that we have a good team and not just one team, but we sent it out to 17 people, 17 different organizations. And I believe we've already heard back from seven or eight people. Um, and also we are hiring for a community mediator. Some of the complaints that we have received do not rise to the level of needing to have a conversation happen with, um, come before the civilian review board, they need to have a conversation with our community and with the officer. Um, there is a cultural um, conversation that sometimes needs to happen with what goes on in BPD, what goes on in our community, those conversations need to happen. Having a community mediator um, will also allow for a community, I want them, I, purposely call them community because I want this person to be in our community. I want them from our community and be in our community, attending the meetings um, and being real representation of our community. So we are actively hiring for that now. So if you know anyone, please send them our way. Um, so next up is that we now have a new police commissioner, Michael Cox, who was a former police, uh, Boston police officer for over 30 years and then left and became chief of police for um, Ann Arbor, in Ann Arbor, Michigan has returned. He's been with us for a little over a month now. I have met with um, Commissioner Cox. I am looking forward to working with Commissioner Cox to really start moving the work forward. Um, what I've said to a lot of people is that while the streets have um, are no longer filled with marches, our work is still moving because our feet are still moving. So I'm looking forward to working on a lot of our police reforms and the efforts that we have been um, pushing for a little bit slower than I would have hoped for over the past year, but really getting that work done with um, Commissioner Cox now that we have a permanent commissioner in place. 
and I should say to my fellow commissioners, if you want to jump in anywhere and add anything, please do so. Um, I don't do this work alone. I do it um, with your boards in play too. So feel free to add in where you want to add in. Um, I also, again, this is not something that's in the um, ordinance to provide, but I think it's important to provide information about what's going on with the post commission. So the Peace Officer Standards and Training Commission, which is basically the state version of us, um, they also were created in 2020. They are setting their own regulations and they're doing a certification. They certify officers to be police officers. So in um, beginning on June 15th, officers whose last name be began between A and H they were required to have um, all of their paperwork into the post commission. And that paperwork included um, attestations from the police commissioner of the, the um, individual officers of their good moral character, as well as a questionnaire that the individual officers had to complete. Due to, and there was 932 for the city of Boston. It's not on here, but I know it because I go to these meetings. 932 for the city of Boston, um, due to a new commissioner coming in the size, there have been two extensions extended to Boston. So the second one was due on September 15th. Do not have an update as of the report, as of the end, as of today, if they were going to meet that. But the second update, the second extension ended on the day that Commissioner Cox was coming in. Um, so they got another extension until September 15th. So I can provide an update um, within another week or so. I can check in with BPD to see where that stands. But um, originally the certification, all this was supposed to go through the post commission, but due to their own newness and having their own commission, their own ED start around roughly a couple of months after I started last year um, and their commission being appointed not too long later, they've been coming up with different systems to certify officers. Um, and so we are working through how we get through A through H. They're working through how they get through A through H, and that's just the first set. There's another set that's due, obviously, which is only nine, this first batch being due. Um, but I did want to provide an update as, because it did hit the paper at some point, but there was an extension that was granted. And I think the reason why is because of the, um, a new commissioner being appointed, plus there was 932. If you compare Boston to the other cities, in towns, 350 cities and towns, they are vastly larger um, and it does take a little bit of time, but Boston was the only one who had not submitted it and they were, but they were not the only ones that asked for the original extension, but they were the ones who, the only ones that got the second extension. Um, so again, just wanted to make sure we were transparent and let you know we are following up on that and also checking it with BPD to make sure that they, they do meet those requirements. Um, also, so um, we have switched over. If you have been with us from the beginning when we've been doing these meetings, we were doing um, how we were doing our quarters and now switching over to fiscal year so that we are now in fiscal year quarter one. We before were just doing quarters based on like when I started. So um, this may be a little confusing to some people, but just so that we are all going in line with the rest of the city, fiscal year will be quarter one will be July through September. We'll get to that. Um, <laughs> you got to. We'll get to that. Um, so July through September 22 is this quarter. So just to give you some um, updates. So this is the, the activity that is required by the ordinance. Um, so we. So on on uh, August 9th. We did have a um, civilian review board meeting. There were um, 17 cases brought before the board. Seven um, cases were dismissed. Um, four for insufficient evidence. Um, three were not sustained and three were found to be out of scope. Um, we also had cases that were on, I'm sorry, on August 17th, the IO, um, the Internal Affairs 
oversight panel board met and they voted on two cases um, and they agreed and they reviewed the, the appeals of internal affairs, um, Boston Police Department's internal affairs department's findings and they agree with the decisions that were put before them in a three to zero um, decision. Um, and the, um, you go through these complaints and I'm gonna go through all of them, but um, the disposition of the CRB cases where CRB referred the matter to the commissioner, we didn't have any of those. Um, I, should, I wanna make sure I answer this one though. Part of the civilian review board's charge is to review cases make recommendations for discipline when they find that there is a matter that is, they have found to be sustained. In order to make a recommendation for discipline, they are to rely on a discipline matrix that is provided to them by the commissioner. As of today, we have not received a discipline matrix from the commissioner. And that is because we have not had a permanent commissioner. That conversation is ongoing to get that matrix. So where it says none, none of, none of the complaints from last month were actually sustained, but I think it's also important to understand we have not had a permanent commissioner. There is not, there is not a discipline matrix. There has never been a discipline matrix. So it's not, there was one that has to be created. I think there is a, um, an expectation that there's been one and that if that's what was being relied on. Discipline always has been something that was um, up for the police commissioner to institute on the individual officer. What the Civilian Review Board will do is issue a recommendation of discipline. They cannot discipline an officer. They offer recommendations that go to the commissioner. The commissioner can either accept the discipline or not. If they choose not to accept the discipline, the commissioner has to write why they're choosing not to accept the recommendation of the civilian review board, all of which we will put on our website because we are transparent. But um, I did want to acknowledge that because I think there's been a lot of confusion about the matrix where people think there's been a matrix forever. Um, there has not. Um, my understanding from talking to a lot of people, the reason why they want a matrix is because there's been a lot of disparity inside of BPD about discipline, especially when it comes to BIPOC officers. So we are, we are working to get a discipline matrix. And once we have one, we will make sure that that's also something that is transparent for people to see. Okay, so um, I will, Again, let you all go through a lot of the public report. I wanted to highlight that, but I'm gonna pause on my reporting out and turn it over to Mariah, who is our policy analyst, to go over the data. Now, I will also say, this will be the first time since we've started having these that a lot of this data has been made public. Um, FIO data has historically been provided through BPD on their dashboard once a year. It's given out and because there's narrative and there's redactions that happen to it, we have um, a mandate that we issue this data out every month. Um, arrest data, FIO data, all that stuff once a month. We don't have any of the narrative information in here, so we cannot give you, provide you with information that we do not have because we did not, we're not waiting for the narrative information. We just wanted the raw data of, um, how many um, failed interactions, observations, or encounters, FIO, um, what that means. Um, we wanted that raw data. It is going to be shocking data. Um, and because it is new that we are getting it, there is still a lot more questions I have and a lot more things that we have to work through. But we have a new commissioner, and we just got this stuff um, starting in July. So I do want people to understand that there's even for um, my fellow commissioners may be shocked by a lot of the things that they see in this. Well, may not be shocked, but seeing it um, all in a um, in this format. But I, I did want you all to see it and be aware of it um, and know that 
we will be suspending it at our meetings um, because it is part of our mandate and we are moving to get more answers about it. Um, but we do not have narrative information that normally you do get from BPD. All right. All right. You. So here I go. Um, the <laughs> the um, so I just want to explain again the data that we have in here specifically from July and August of 20, um, 2022. And uh, the number of complaints received, type of misconduct alleged, and the investigatory status of those complainants. So um, for quarter one, um, July and August, um, we received nine complainants, nine complaints. Um, the complaint reports were down 30% from last quarter. Um, so there was 52.2% um, from last quarter. And then now there's only 22.5. This is excluding uh, September. Uh, the types of misconduct alleged in these cases for the quarter were unprofessionalism, harassment, civil rights violations, and all of these, uh, the investigatory status for all of these complaints are still pending. Um, the race, ethnicity, and gender um, orientation and age of the complainants um, were Asian and white Cape Verdean um, and white um, alone, uh, and some declined to answer. Uh, there were four males, four females, and one declined to answer. Uh, sexual orientation was heterosexual, gay, lesbian, or same gender loving, and ages range from 29 to 58. So up there is the data up there. You can see the stuff that I um, over. So for the next um, set of uh, dashboard, we're going to go on to um, the field and interaction, observation, and encounter data. Um, just to give a few definitions um, before I explain um, the data. Um, the encounter, we, so these terms come from BPD's own uh, Rule 323. Um, document um, that explains what uh, FOIE is and what the uh, definitions of some of their uh, encounters and observation and stops are. Um, but we kind of uh, put our, we kind of uh, made sure it was more uh, layman's terms. So it's not ex verbatim what the um, Rule 323 document has on there for definitions, but we made them easier to understand. So um, encounter is defined as agreed upon interaction with individuals that does not lead to an official stop or frisk. If you, um, if you encounter an individual with the reason for gathering information, you must document the interaction. Observation is defined as direct viewing of an individual or officer that does not include actual contact with the individual. Reasonable suspicion is necessary when conducting an observation of an individual, but the purpose of documenting the observation must be to gather information or to justify documenting the observation. Build interaction, uh, interaction or stop is defined as holding an individual in custody briefly, whether on foot or in a vehicle based on reasonable suspicion. This is determined um, this is to determine if the individual's identity and settle officer suspicion. Uh, we also have a link down there to, to um, our site, which gives more definitions on FYE um, data. So you can go there too if you have any other questions. Um, so specifically, I, uh, can you change? Yep, there we go. So specifically, I focused on right underneath the map where it says stop by race and ethnicity. Um, I wanted to specify that because um, clearly you can see that there's overrepresentation of black um, people. This is not, um, this is including their uh, ethnicity. Um, so not Hispanic or Hispanic as well. Um, so out of uh, 1691 people, 16,009, 
and now do you want people? 1,600. 1,600. Sorry. 1,600. <laughs> Out of 1,600 people, 0.4% um, are uh, Asian, not Hispanic. 0.1% um, were Asian. Um, Black Hispanic were 6%. Black not Hispanic were 26%. Um, black unknown ethnicity were nine, other not Hispanic were 0.1, other Hispanic were one, other unknown ethnicity were 0.3, white not Hispanic was 5%, white Hispanic was 4%, and white unknown ethnicity was two. You can go to the next slide. So here we have um, youth FOIE um, data, which we're also um, after this meeting should be on our dashboard shortly, specifically where we made a dashboard uh, just for youth um, because the data was so uh, alarming. Um, so uh, this right now is the FOIE, FOIE, FOIE data uh, for adults was 74% um, for adults and it was 26% for children. Um, out of the 26 for children, one was a 12 year old, 14 were 13 year olds, 14 were 14 year olds, 42 were 15 year olds, 48 were 16 year olds, 54 were 17 year olds, 69 were 18 year olds, 54 were 19 year olds, 65 were 20 year olds, and 73 were 21 year olds. The one, uh, one 12 year old where he was stopped, he was stopped, which was the circumstance in the encounter. The basis was reasonable suspicion and the zip code was 02121. Um, I thought that was alarming, so I, I figured I'd point that out. And that was our youngest. Uh, so, Yep, next slide. Um, so FIOE -I -I by circumstance. So this um, wasn't broken down by ethnicity. So um, included in um, black and in white are, it could be Hispanic, not Hispanic um, as well, but um, breaking it down by gender. So black girls, 20 were stopped, around 10 were encountered, um, black boys, a little over 180 were stopped, close to 40 were observed, and around 50 uh, were encountered. Um, for girls that um, we don't know their race, one was stopped and one was encountered. Same thing for boys, five stopped and three encountered. Unknown race and gender, one stopped. Unknown race for girls, um, five stopped and one encountered. Unknown race for boys, 40 stopped. Uh, two encountered and uh, two observed and 10 encountered and white girls, five were stopped. Uh, white boys, 40 were stopped, five observed and 10 encountered. Um, again, if you want to see the basis um, of the circumstance, uh, uh, circumstances, you can go on our website um, to view that as well. And I'm done with the data. Well, you're not done with the data. Well, not, not <laughs> done with the data, but She's done, She's done presenting. She's done presenting. <laughs> Can I ask a question? Yes. Um, is it broken down by um, divisions and within the Boston Police, like Area Two, or? So I can break it down by that. I haven't. I'd done. love to see it broken down like that, and I'd love to see okay. um, the Youth Gang Task Force. Okay. Broken down by precinct. Yes. Okay. Okay. Oh. Right. Precinct and use gang task force. Yes. Okay. And Commissioner Alvarez also has. Yeah. So thank you. Question. Um, and this may be the way that data is collected. I know like the the federal government collects data without um like not separating out Hispanic and it does create a little bit of a, a difficulty. I would say probably a fair amount of the Hispanics in Boston are probably, I think it's officer reported. So they would report what they think the person is. And, you know, I would probably a fair amount could be black Hispanic, but I do think 
since there is like no Native American box here or something, there's probably a fair amount of Latinos that are falling in the unknown or white bucket. And I think what what that does sometimes is kind of this. Um, this is a comment, but also a question to know if it's possible to to, to distinguish. But um, it, it it can cloud make the data cloudy because the disparities may be even more pronounced than what they are here between white and black or white and Latino, but you're not really able to tell because of the way the data is collected. So I don't know if there is, if this is just kind of cribbing off of the data, the way that the data is reported to the federal government, which I know that they, they report it this way too, or if there's any way that it can be reported in a way that, you know, you could get the numbers for Latinos. I, I think it could help us find language issues and, um kind of other disparities and would probably make the white black dispar disparity even larger because you're not including um people that you know that are latino in there that may not look white but there's not really a bucket here for them either so just so, wasn't sure how like how it's how, like is there any room to change that or what what's the reasoning behind well, it well if you go on to our website um, these are the ones I just picked out specifically the charts, but if you go onto our website, it's interactive and I have a chart that specifically breaks down the ethnicity with the race. And if you click on, like I say, one of the charts, the others will, um, uh, filter. Um, and then you could see the breakdown, ethnicity, race, circumstance, basis, the area code, the age, all of that on there. I just didn't um, put that in the report right now because I need. I didn't want it to be. I didn't want to lengthen the the, the reporting out, but um, it's on our website. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. <clears throat> no problem. Um, I, I also want to make sure that we tie this in before I move on to the next part um, to why it's so important that we do center um, a lot of our work on the youth um, in our office. Um, it was an alarming rate to see the amount of youth. And so we are defining youth up, I think, until 21, 22 in our office. Um, and that's why we do have the high school college um, so that we do have a focus on, in our office on that. It's the reason why we are developing the Youth Advisory Council. It is the reason why we are um, focusing in the summertime on these, um, working with the youth the YAE program, working with BCYF, really centering a lot of work because having, and um, Judge, I'm pretty sure you know this, and Peter and I know this as attorneys, um, but when young um, people have negative encounters or an encounter period with an officer at a young age, um, it centers them and it focuses them and it creates a foundation for them um, that carries them through adulthood. And so we need to figure out what that looks like, why it's happening, and start having these positive conversations and with them and opening up this office for them to come in here and have these free-spirited conversations um, and working with Commissioner Cox about what does that look like? Why is it happening? Because these numbers are, were very alarming for us, especially in the summertime when we have more kids who are outside in the summertime, right? Um, and so we need to create the space here and create the dialogue in the community. So again, the marches aren't happening, but our feet are still moving and we do need to create these conversations and create these community trust, right? So we, we want to have trust in our communities, but we have to make sure that we, we continue to engage our youth and make sure that our youth are, are part of the solutions and that we're not always driving for them what they should be doing because a 12 year old had an interaction with an officer and we don't know what that looks like because they didn't call us. This is just data that we received. Um, so, um, There's a question. yeah, we're going to go to the, when we get to the public comment period, I have one more thing and then we're going to get to public comment period. Um, so just as a wrap up, just so everyone knows what's going on here too, we did have, uh, we filed our first annual annual report on August 4th. You are also able to go on our website. Our website is ever evolving, ever changing. We are still moving. Um, in the right direction of making sure that we ourselves are just as transparent. So any chance that we can to put out information, we are doing just that. Um, so in that, in our website, you can find your inner report so you can do a look back and a look forward. So 
So it includes the investments, but it also includes the stuff that we talked about um, that we want to do in moving OPAC forward. Um, and more importantly, I think it's one of the things that we talk about a lot internally, and I've been talking about it with other cabinet heads and other community members when I speak to them, is really getting to know who we are. If you know me individually or other people in this office individually, you know where we work and what we do, but um, not enough people in the city know who we are and how we exist and actually what our job is and what some of the limitations of our jobs are. So we are doing a um, public drive of getting to know us. We started it before, but we're being very, very intentional um, in getting information about even this meeting to community centers, to libraries, um, I even posted it on a, a, a social media site. So really just making sure that we are being very intentional about getting people here so that you know what we do. Um, and we're going to start having a listening session. We have not planned thoroughly out yet, um, but that listening session will also include information about who BPD is, um, BPD, so Boston Police Department, so it's not just people who arrest someone, but knowing what the clerk's office does, know what you can do at, at the Boston Police Department um, and not just be a police officer. They do have a law department. They do have um, cadet programs. There's a lot of other things that you can do inside of BPD other than be police officers. Um, and so really opening up that world to the rest of the community is going to be important work that we do. Um, so we will continue to do a lot of outreach so that you are really aware of what we do here because it's important that we are just as transparent, just as transparent as we are asking the police department to be. Um, and so with that, I will end my comments on the public on our public report, but um, now open it up for public comment period. So again, we're going to give you about 90 seconds to two minutes to, re to give us your feedback. Those who are on Zoom, you have a couple of options on how you make this happen. Um, you can type your comment. Um, I can't see you, so hopefully my staff can. Raise your hand um, and they will acknowledge you and have you come on when it's your turn. We're going to talk to those who are in, in person first and let them speak. If you are speaking here, please, you haven't done so, make sure you sign up or sign up when you leave. It's so, just so we capture who did speak because we are required to maintain a list of who spoke at our meetings. Um, but did I get everything? Anybody missing anything? So other than that, if you want to talk, please, you just have to come up here because we do have to keep a recording of it. So just come to this table um, and feel free to speak as much, minute and a half to two minutes. Um, I understand. Thank you. Um, I understand that um, there's several limitations, it seems, that this office has since it's been introduced into the city. You don't have any law enforcement ability. Um, you have very little to offer in terms of responding when the police make mistakes. From what I understand, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. But I thought you brought an opportunity for the public to be heard and for things to get aired in an open police transparency kind of format. What's disturbing to me though, is um, how this seems to be playing out in real life in real time. You've had several meetings from what I understand and voted on several topics, but the public is very limited in their awareness of what has transpired 
your board is rather shallow in terms of uh, details. So how does that differ to what the police department has offered the public from the internal affairs and anti-corruption and internal divisions? When the city of Boston, whenever you apply for things, they don't turn it over. They don't surrender it. You guys have had meetings now and you've ruled on several cases, it seems. And yet, from the public perspective, as a city of Boston resident, I have no idea what has happened. I have my own personal event that I won't discuss in detail, but I have no knowledge as to how it played out or how it happened. And the investigators involved never even took the time to speak with me, but my matter was presented to the board and they made decisions without my input. Now, personally and professionally speaking, I know you can't have an investigation without talking to the very person that's involved. But unfortunately for me, that's what happened here and my fate was in your hands. What I saw as an opportunity to be exonerated was stolen from me by the Office of Police Accountability and Transparency. And the more I'm talking, I'm getting upset, so I'm going to decline to say anything further. But thank you for hearing me. So um, I will, I, I'm not going to respond to everything. I think it's a matter is something that was personal to you. Um, and you're, you're, and I think because it's personal to you, um, one, we have not had meetings behind closed doors. And I, I want to make sure that we, we don't keep that. Um, we have um, open meeting laws. And I don't want, and I'm not going to um, have it out there that we have violated any open meeting laws. Every meeting that we have, we publicly note. That is number one. Number two, we also, by law, have an have a right, and um, everybody who has a case before a board receives notification that their case is going to be heard by the respective board on a certain date. In that notice, you're also aware that cases will be heard in executive session due to an exception to the open meeting law that allows for public employees information to be discussed in executive session. So on public employees information, which Boston Police Department um, and, and Boston Police officers are, their cases are discussed in public in executive session, not in open meeting. So when those matters are heard, public is made aware. If you are before the Civilian Review Board, you are made aware that the Civilian Review Board is going into executive session and these walls are closed, sound machines are put on, and the public hearing is put on hold while the Civilian Review Board discusses in executive session, which is not open to the public, the matters before it. Once the Civilian Review Board is done discussion, discussing those matters, they vote and come out of executive session and they publicly, individually, give an answer to every matter that they discuss in executive session. If they are discussing a matter before the Eternal Affairs Oversight Panel. They are allowed to close out, they meaning the Eternal Affairs Oversight Panel, the public meeting before going into executive session so that members are not sitting here because the ordinance does not require them to vote in public what their decision is on the case. Eternal Affairs Oversight Panel is a review, almost an it's an appeal. It is almost not almost. It is an appeal of the turn of the Boston Police Department's internal affairs. So they are looking at the review that looking at a review of what Boston Police Department did. They are not reinvestigating the case all over again. There is a difference. It's not a limitation, and there is a difference. It's, it, it is similar to what happens in, in courts, and I'll let the judge explain you know, the difference in that, but you don't present new evidence in appeal. You look at what was there. You look to make sure that the Boston Police Department did their job, and if they 
should have done something different, if they didn't do something, we, we are looking at those things. But there's not a reintroduction of new information to the panel and making a decision whether or not the, the matter was, be, was looked at in the way that it should have been looked at at the time that it was presented to the Boston Police Department. But those matters are all handled underneath the Massachusetts open meeting law appropriately and as required by law. Nothing is done in a way that it should not have been done. It may not and will not always result in the way that the public wants it to, but it is always done with a lot of care, a lot of meetings, a lot of time with staff and with the panel. And I've watched every board member give it their all. I've watched every staff member give it their all and then some and speak to numerous people about cases. Nothing is taken lightly when cases are given a, a, a decision. And I, I don't know if the judge has anything. I, I do that. because um, there are limitations on what we can do as a um, board of the commission. And one of the good things is that you can try to fight to change that. I would love to have more power than we do. But I didn't create OPED and set the limits on us. And I have to work within those limits. Yes, as in court, I didn't always agree what was dictated by the law, but I had to follow the law. And my suggestion and my hope is that you won't drop it, that you will talk to the mayor and others about expanding the power, if necessary, of OPEC. Oh, thank you. And um, yeah, <clears throat> I just wanted to talk on Alvarez that. Also had a fit. Yeah, just on uh -huh. behalf of CRB, just want to make it um, you, you, make you. a state make a statement more or less. We have a lot. The CRB members engage in very impassioned um, discussion uh, when we have cases before us. When we go into executive session. Um, we really are deliberate. We think about it. We ask a lot of questions. Um, so I just want people to know, like as representatives of the people appointed by the mayor and the city council, um, you know, I think it's really important for everyone listening to know that in the C Civilian Review Board, we really do take the mandate seriously. And I know that IOP does that as well. And so does OPAT. And I want people to know that what was in place prior to all of this was there was not any way for someone to go and really make an independent complaint that was going to get, you know, outside of the police department to go and do that and have all the data collection that we have now and actually at least have some assurances that there are, you know, these nine people that are selected. Um, that are appointed to this board, at least on behalf of CRB, that are going to be looking at their cases. Um, so, you know, in, in an office that's going to investigate them, that is going to do a neutral investigation that's outside of the police department and doesn't have the kind of um, difficulties of someone trying to make a complaint at the police department in which they, you know, may have felt wronged by. So I think, you know, it provides a new avenue. There's additional data collection. And I do want to stress that the members of the Civilian Review Board take their mandate seriously and engage in rigorous discussion about the matters that come before us. Um, and, you know, I, I just want to make sure that I say that because uh, on behalf of the board members, I know everyone takes their job really seriously. Um, and I don't want I don't want that to go unnoticed and just wanted to make sure folks knew what the, you know, what was in place before versus what we have now. It may not be perfect, as as Judge Commissioner said, but, you know, it is what we have and it is an improvement on what was there prior. I appreciate you both. Thank you. I also welcome the challenge to expand. Um, sir. Hello, everyone. Um, so I'm going to speak now as a resident and Black man in Boston. First of all, I appreciate this office for many reasons. I appreciate um, that you're in the community. I appreciate that you all have created a space where 
one of the most uh, complicated institutions within the bureaucratic institution of the city of Boston can be challenged and legitimized um, by the office. Um, I appreciate the diversity of the office. So I, I just want to be very clear about that. I have comments and then a question. Um, obviously, I work in the city for the Office of Black Male Advancement. I'm looking at these data and right around 41% of the people that were stopped in uh, July and August are black men. I suspect that's even higher um, when you look at the other uh, data. That's extremely concerning. Um, the FIO of youth data is extremely concerning. Um, I guess my question is, do you feel that you all have the uh, ability to make recommendations to the police department based on these data? Or is it a situation, and also who collects these data for the police? Is it a situation where they collect it and then they send you the raw information? Because if they're the ones collecting it, that's inherently problematic because I suspect that they're not being entirely truthful. Um, the real question that I have though uh, is on the discipline matrix. Um, is there not a general standard that's put across Massachusetts? Is, is it so it's subjective to the commissioner that comes in and makes that decision? So hypothetically, I'm sorry, I'm like shaking my head and you know no one else can see that. Uh, I'm sorry. sorry. So, <laughs> so so it is so it is subjective to the commissioner coming in and making and deciding that discipline matrix. So for all intents and purposes, if we got a new commissioner, there would be a different discipline matrix. So there there is just not one. Period. period. So that that's and one of the tasks that I have when I first came on, the, besides reading the audience before I even applied for the job, was that okay, I'm going to get this matrix. And I think that there was, and speaking with a lot of people, and I won't say everyone, there was a belief that the matrix existed. Um, so in believing that the matrix existed, there was a belief that there was some matrix that can just be used. Um, and that the civilian review board would just have something immediately at their disposal. What we have found is that um, there are different discipline matrix in play across the country. Um, Boston being one of the, being the oldest, I'm going to stick to that saying, um, the oldest police department in the entire country. They have um, internal workings that need assistance as well as the assistance of us for the external, right? And so that's the reason we're having a consultant look at their internal hiring, retention, and promotion. Um, it became very clear that in talking to officers from um, that there is a need for a matrix because you had um, BIPOC officers who were being disciplined at a harsher rate than their white counterparts. Um, so you, this is a great opportunity for us to weigh in. It, it, it's almost a good thing that it didn't exist before. Uh, you want it to exist, but given that the structure as it was has not been great, um, as I have had it relayed, I don't work there, but um, BIPOC officers will benefit from having this office help weigh in on discipline matrix by us working with a consultant who is also going to meet with, like we're meeting with the affinity um, officers um, groups. We're meeting with different people who are invested in making sure that their, um, that BPD is diverse as the community it serves. So it doesn't, once it's in place, it's in place, it's gonna be hard for them to change it, right? So. I don't think that once it's in play that it's gonna change, I think it's also going to have some ramifications with union. So I don't think it's gonna be one of those things once it's in play that the next commissioner can come and be like, okay, I don't like this, so I'm gonna change it. It will be harder to change it then. Um, and that's why it's gonna be critically important that we as a community, we as OPAT, we as everyone has a say and what happens next. And so we do encourage people to be, and this is why getting to know OPAD is so important because 
you know, I like to walk around. I always tell people walk around with a needle uh, and just pop your own bubble sometimes because we need to hear from other people what is going to be important for us to have. My last question, I guess, is there you are collecting or the data is being collected on um, gender and sexual orientation. And based on what, like my, my own independent research, anecdotal research, I know that police departments are historically challenged in how they classify people um, as people. And again, my question is, do you feel that you all have the authority to guide BPD? Like if there is, it was brought up earlier, the way that race is tracked, it's horribly tracked across the board, but if you all could make that recommendation, is there room to do so? And if not, is there other offices in the city that could help get that to the forefront? We don't do anything alone. We don't do anything. Like what we have done um, has always been collaborative approach. So um, can we do it alone? Do we have the air of BPD? Yes, we do. We meet with BPD. We talk to BPD. We, we meet with the mayor. And um, But do we do it alone? No. We work with other organizations. We work with the organization um, with Frank Farrell. We work with um, YAE. We work with Equity. Um, we think that it is a collaborative approach. Um, we also think it's an approach that requires BPD to buy in from the beginning. Um, and so meeting with the new commissioner and really being concrete. We do meet, um, my team meets with, starting this earlier this year, we have a data meeting with BPD because we know that the data comes from them and we want to be intentional about what that data looks like. Um, again, the FIO data was, we were, they were only reporting out once a year. That wasn't good for us. It's also not required, our ordinance requires us to report it out once a month. And so now this is the first time that we were able to report it out. Um, and so we don't have all the answers. Um, what was the reasonable suspicion? What was this? We don't have all that information. Um, I'm trying to be very nice in this. I didn't need all of the, I didn't need the narrative. What I wanted to know was the data yes. um, because now we need to have, because for me, stopping the 12 year old, I think I've been, since we've gotten this 12 year old data, that's all I talk about is stopping the 12 year old is enough for me to have a conversation, yes. right? Um, the narrative that comes with the 12 year old, not so much my concern. Stopping the 12 year old is my concern. Yes. As a community member, as a mother, as the ED of this office, the 12 year old is my concern, um, not the narrative. And I think that's the thing that we should focus on is not everything else, just what, and if it's the 12 year old needs services, right? If it's the officer needs training, what is all of that we can deal with, but I, like, I gotta get to that. Um, and I can't wait a year for you to tell me why you need to write the narrative. So it, it's, those are the things that we are getting to in this office. So yes, we can do it. Um, because we did do it. We started this process at the beginning of the year saying we're going to have meetings because we're going to start getting this data. Um, and in July, six months later, we started getting the data. So I, I, we do have the, the powers to do it, but we can't and we should not have to do it alone because we do have a city and we do have a community. Thank you all. Well, now, I've got to get back to you, Kevin, oh, yes, all you all have to exist. Have been raised, my son and nephew, in this community, living here. Um, I have the same concern that most of you have. Um, I've been stopped by the police. I've had guns pulled on me by the police here in Boston. And I am just as concerned about data collection because that's our proof. You know, a 12-year-old, being stopped in question is never voluntary. I don't care what that was, the voluntary. No, there's no such thing. Um, and I think I need to know personally how different parts of the city are being stopped. And that's why I want the individual precinct. And yeah, yeah. you know, and I live in 02121. So I know how my community is treated. And I am a supporter of the police. 
I've come from a police enforcement family, but I've also been a victim of police. And there's a balance that we as a community have to have with them and hold them responsible, you know, when they mess up. And if we don't keep the data, if we don't say what 12 year old do you stop any place else in this state, except in my community. And that's the first thing I saw reading the data. That's the first thing that stayed with me, a 12 year old. I hate to tell you, it's not gonna leave you. It's oh no, and I mean, even and 13 and 14 year olds yet. bothers me because I got grandkids mm -hmm. and great grandkids. And so I don't want them to be living my life. And so this is concerning for all of us. And I thank you. I don't want to not give Commissioner Alvarez. I don't know if you want to say anything before we move. Okay. Sir. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Leroy Stoddard. I'm a resident of Jamaica Plain. I want to draw your attention to a wrongful death suit going to federal court next Wednesday. Uh, I'm going to be there with supporters of this man and his family, uh, and I want to leave you each a card. You can read about this case if you don't uh, not familiar with it. It was uh, 31 shots fired by six officers, five Boston police, two and a half years ago. There's been a report from the Norfolk County DA. In 30 days, he exonerated those officers. The Suffolk County DAs have not yet issued a report after two and a half years. Uh, there are so many questions in this case. Uh, just from my uh, layperson examination, it stinks. This is a mentally ill man. Four out of 10 people killed by the police nationwide are mentally ill. Four and a half of them are white. As Barack Obama said, if I had a son, he'd look like me. And I think there's a way in which the treatment of this man without racial bias being a factor, the shooting down of a downed man by six officers, a wounded downed man, a wounded man who had bled out, who when he fell out of his car at Chestnut Hill Mall, a woman who worked as an EMT ran over to help him. And the officers, when they arrived in their many, many, many cars, after crashing into him, uh, told her to get out of the way, kicked him down, and proceeded to shoot him down. This, if our police department continues to employ the officers without an examination that were involved in this, all of us are under threat. My children are under threat because you take racial bias out, you reach the default position of a police department. This is how we treat people who look like us. You see what I'm saying? This needs attention, it needs alliance, it needs solidarity. It needs examination by people in your position and people in your position. Uh, and I think we can achieve some justice. We, we, we certainly need to, it's overdue. So please hand these out. The, uh, it's 928 or 9 a.m. a week from today. Uh, you may not be able to hold a sign like I am, but the other people will. And uh, for this commission to learn from this case, what went wrong, what went wrong after that, what went wrong after that, what was said by officers after they shot. Look into that. There were some things that nobody should be saying when death is in front of them. Things that were said, they raise the kind of issues that are at the core of why we have a body such as OPAD, and why we need it. We need you to be strong and determined to give us justice and a police department we deserve. Thank you. That's to remind you that we can't look at individual cases. As lay people, 
You can read the press. I have done what, that. What you do is you read the press, you read other reports. You can inform yourselves, as you did, about George Floyd, about Breonna Taylor, about what happens in our own city. So I'm not asking you to conduct an investigation. I don't have standing as a family member. All I'm saying is this case is important to pay attention to, to see what it says about training, about discipline, uh, about accountability and transparency. It's got elements of all those in there, and it's a study item, maybe. But uh, I, I'm just bringing it to your attention, and I appreciate the time. Okay. Yes. Just wanted to acknowledge and thank him for uh, making the comment. And I think any time that someone... we have someone from the um, Zoom chat who wants us to also get testimony. My name is Michael Reiskin. I'm from Jamaica Plain. Uh, I've got three questions. I'll ask two and then ask to be heard again if there's time. Um, I'm wondering if uh, surveillance and drones and helicopters are in your mandate. I know they are in the post, um, state post uh, uh, mandate, but I'm wondering if uh, OPAT is planning to deal with it. And my second question is, uh, a process question, uh, is the FIO form used by the Boston Police Department available and can you make it available uh, to me? Thank you. Oh, what, what form, I'm sorry? The FIO form, field in interrogation and observation form. We have. It's all on our website. The the FIO form is on your website, or just the results on of the uh, the actual form itself. Oh, the form that they use when they they pull someone out when they stop yes. someone. I, yes. I do. I, we don't have that form. You would. Can you would you have make to it get it from. Can you, you make it available? So we don't have it. So in order for you to get it, you would have to make a public record request to the Boston Police Department. But you don't. So we don't. We don't. You, do, you don't think don't that's have, helpful for transparency if that's available? So we don't have the form. I, I don't even know if they have an actual form or if it's just questions that they ask. Okay. So okay. we will look. Okay, it's I appreciate it. And, yeah. The other one was on surveillance and uh, drones and helicopters. So we, we don't have, unless there's a specific request made for that, we don't actually have it. It's, as far as surveillance is concerned, there is a surveillance ordinance that um, the city council put before, um, that's in effect in the city of Boston. The first um, batch of information was submitted to the city council last month. Um, and from that information, um, they were there will be more recommendations um, that will come from that. And that information um, included um, anything that was being used to um, help BPD and other public safety units inside of the city look at um, and well, protect and survey our, our city. Um, I do not, and I've read over the entire thing, I do not recall anything on anything with drones specifically, um, but so for me, I don't have any recommendations on it, but it doesn't mean that no recommendations on drones would be forthcoming. But if something is coming down from the state, then it would apply to us, and it would just be something that the city council would have to bring up but more than happy to look into it.
Say any others? Is that it? No comments. Okay. So I appreciate everyone coming with no comments left and um, no one else in the audience. I am happy to entertain a motion to close out our community meeting. Motion to close out community meeting. Uh, I, I appreciate that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. Thank you. So our community meeting is officially closed. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you to our interpreters as well. Thank you.